Hey kids, it's Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Now, for the last couple of weeks, I've been riding around on this puppy, the Husqvarna 701 Vitpillen. I've ridden it on all sorts of roads, in all sorts of conditions, and I've learned as much as I possibly can about the bike. If you're interested in this machine, stick around and stay tuned. So in this video then, I'm going to take you through all the things that I've learned in my time with the bike. It's going to be much more of an in-depth review than you would get if you just did, say, a one-hour test ride. So in the video, I'm going to look at what the bike's like to ride on the motorway, what it's like on country lanes, what's it like in the wet, what's it like to ride at night. I'm also going to talk to you about the cost of ownership for the bike. And uh, towards the end of the video, I'm going to give you my list of the pros and cons of the bike. What are the, lists, uh, the lessons I've learned since I've been with the machine? So if you're interested in the Husqvarna Vitpillen 701, you're going to want to stick around and stay tuned. So what's the vit pillar like in inclement conditions? Well, it's a pretty wet and rainy, horrible old day today. And I've been uh, riding the bike in this horrible weather for about the last half an hour. And I have to say, I've uh, had no moments whatsoever. It's been good as gold. Things like the fact that the bike's got lean angle sensitive ABS and traction control do help. It means that, uh, you know, in the case of small misdemeanors, the bike is probably going to help you out. So that's confidence inspiring, as are the tyres. I've had no lack of grip on this whatsoever. I haven't had any moments slipping around on the white lines. Of course, at some point, physics comes to the fore, and if you ride like a lunatic in these sort of conditions, then uh, I'm sure the bike will skid and slip and you'll come off. But uh, yeah, as much as any bike is uh, good in the wet, then uh, I think this is absolutely fine. I suspect most of these fit pillars are gonna live in nice warm garages and won't come out on wet days, but occasionally you get caught out, don't you? Uh, but have no fear. Uh, it seems to handle very well in the wet, no problems at all. So thumbs up for uh, riding the bit pill in inclement conditions. So how about on faster roads, so dual carriageways, motorways, that sort of thing? Well, first thing I have to say is there's absolutely no lack of grunt in this bike. Here I am doing an indicated uh, 78 at the moment, uh, so you can easily keep up with fast traffic. Overtaking is not an issue. Just uh, check my mirrors, come up with this vehicle now. Winding on the... The bike absolutely flies easily into very naughty speeds if you wanted to. I shall ease off again because I don't want to be doing naughty speeds. The only thing is, it is a naked bike, so you are subject to the wind blast, but because uh, you are in this canted forward position, actually it doesn't feel too bad. It's a very clean airflow and uh, there's no issue holding on to the bike because of the position that you're in. So thumbs up for riding on faster roads on the little Husky. Okay, so what about touring on the Husqvarna Vitpillen? Well, it wouldn't be my first choice, I have to say. The uh, bike is let down from the touring point of view. Two major aspects. One, there's no real place on the back that you can strap luggage to. The back end is very minimalist. Uh, there's no pannier points or anything like that, or nowhere you can put a rack. So even hanging over soft panniers would be a bit of a challenge, I think. So you're going to have to be rucksacked up. So that's the first thing. You've got to think about how you're going to carry your stuff. And then the second thing is the fact that the seat itself is quite hard. It's not terribly uncomfortable for short runs of up to, you know, an hour or even two. But if you're going to be out on the bike for seven, eight hours on a long tour, then I think uh, you're going to quickly get fed up with this, uh, with this seat, which is quite hard. All that said, of course, you can tour on any motorcycle. Stick yourself a rucksack on and off you go. And uh, whenever you get to your destination, this bike is going to be an absolutely hoop to throw around. So. Uh, don't let what I say put you off. If you can only have one bike and you want an all-rounder, you could make this uh, an all-rounder, no problem. All I'm saying is, it's not as good to tour on as, say, something like a, you know, a purpose-built touring bike. But boy, when you got to where you're going, you could have some great fun. Now often people ask me about the practical aspects of, uh, of owning a bike like this and there are some unusual things that crop up. One of the things that occasionally comes up is what does the horn sound like? Well, I can't necessarily uh, give you a good uh, demo of the horn just using the mic that's uh, on my lapel here, but we'll start her up, and, well not start her up, but we'll turn the ignition on and give you a blast horn just so you can hear the sort of tone of it and it's like this. Oh, very shrill and very loud. So that's the horn, that's one thing that people ask me about. The other thing is about chain maintenance. So as you can see on the VIP pillar, there is no centre stand, and of course it's a chain-driven bike, so you're going to have to look after and lube the chain. You're going to have to find a way of getting the, uh, 
the back wheel off the deck so you can spin it around and lube it, so you're going to have to get yourself an ABBA stand or some paddock stands, or you're going to have to go old school and wheel it around your drive whilst you're lubricating it. So uh, no centre stand, you're going to have to lift the uh, wheel off to sort the chain out. Another question that comes up quite often is what about the seating position? Well, if you have a look at this little clip here, you can see uh, where my legs uh, reach the floor. I'm five foot eight with a 32 inch inseam, uh, and I can get my feet, well, the balls of my feet, either side of the bike uh, nicely on the floor. And because it's such a lightweight bike, uh, I don't have any feelings that I'm going to drop it or anything like that. So, uh, and touch wood, so far I haven't done. So the seating position is nice and upright, and you can get your feet down nice and easily. Okay, so what about riding the bike in the urban environment? Well, I'm not exactly in the middle of a busy town here, but there is quite a bit of traffic about. And again, this is where the lightness of the bike comes to the fore. If you're in uh, queuing traffic like this, and you're stopping and starting, absolutely no feeling that you're going to drop the bike. When you put your feet down, you've got a good solid base because the bike's nice and light. And also, if you're into your filtering, you can nip into the smallest gap quite easily. The bike itself is pretty physically small. That doesn't feel small when you're riding it because of the sort of, I would say laying on stance, although you're not laying on it, it feels a bit like you are, but uh, laying on it would be to overstate it. But because the bike is quite small, it doesn't have massive road presence. So uh, I guess that may be an issue, but uh, just a minor point, I'm clashing at straws there really. If you're gonna use this bike as a commuter, it would be really great. Nipping in and out of traffic around town is brilliant. So quite a long first gear, so you wouldn't have to be stirring the gearbox too much while you're in amongst traffic. And in fact, if you do overdo it, then you'll end up uh, suffering from the vibes on that big old single CC engine. But uh, yeah, really a bike that's uh, equally at home in the urban environment as it is on the twisties. Top marks for the Husky, as far as that's concerned. So at the start of the video, I promised you I'd talk a bit about the cost of ownership of one of, the one of these machines. I've done a little bit of research to find out the typical costs that you'd have to outlay to keep one of these in your garage. I'm not going through things like um, depreciation and uh, cost of consumables like new tyres. You'll have to add those in, but just these sort of fixed costs that just keep the bike uh, roadworthy in your garage. So the uh, research went a bit like this. Uh, first off, road tax is above 600cc, so in this country you're going to be at the top uh, of the road tax tariff, so £80 a year for road tax. Uh, insurance, I uh, got myself a quote for this bike, uh, the best I could get was £212.80 with a £500 excess, so £212.80, didn't think that was too bad, uh, and also I went to the nearest uh, dealer to get a service quote as well. Now the initial 600 mile service it would just be parts only at this particular dealer, would cost around £60, and then the service intervals for this machine are quite short, every 6,000 miles, and that is because uh, the valve clearances need to be checked uh, every 6,000 miles, and that's a £300 service at that particular dealer. So. Uh, if you add that all together, uh, £80 for the tax, £2,280 for the insurance and £300 for the servicing, um, assuming you're doing less than 6,000 miles a year or, or no more than that, then you're looking at uh, £592.80 per month, uh, sorry, per year, uh, or £49.40 a month. So uh, say 50 quid just to keep it in your garage and roadworthy, um, not including depreciation and consumables. Now I've been doing a few of these calculations over the last few years as I've doing the, been doing these bike reviews, uh, and that's one of the cheaper bikes that I've come across. So good news there. So it turns out the Vitpillen is one of those bikes that really likes to throw the crud all over itself. I mean, just look at this. I've been out uh, in the rain for a few times on it, but it's absolutely filthy. And of course, that sort of thing plays havoc with my OCD, so I'm going to get the buckets out and I'm going to give her a darn good wash and uh, get her back to how she should be. Oh, and if you want to see my technique for how I wash a motorcycle, don't want to teach you to suck eggs or anything, but some people do ask me, then I have got a video on that very subject. I'll put the card just up here.
So in terms of nuisance to clean factor, I would say the uh, Husky scores quite highly. There's an awful lot of nooks and crannies here. We've got the scaffolding to get through. The wheels are a bit of a pain to get to. The exhaust, everything here gets really cruddy. So uh, this one actually is quite tricky to clean. It's not a straightforward bike with lots of fairings. Uh, you've got to like cleaning to own this bike. And because of all the nooks and crannies, Strongly recommend a bike dryer. It's a little bit tricky. So what's the Husky like to ride at night? Well, as you can see, it's not night at the moment, but I thought what I'd do is just uh, pull in up here uh, the uh, rather fancy Great Mistleton Tennis Club, and I'll just show you what the lights are like in the day, uh, and then I'll show you the bike at night, and uh, we can see how she performs. Well, very busy in here today. Well, I'll just quickly uh, show you what the lights look like. Right, so I'll leave the bike running so you can see what they're like in sort of daytime running mode, if you like. So the lights on here are really fancy, actually. I love the way they've got that sort of circular bit around the outside. But this is normal daylight running mode. Top half of the light is on. If you put it on full beam, then you get the bottom half on as well. And it uh, looks pretty bright from here, but we'll see what it's like actually at night. What it is lacking is a, uh, is a flasher on the front of this. So if you want to flash the light, then you're going to have to use a full switch, which is unusual. And then I'll just show you the backlight as well, which I think is super cool. Uh, don't know if it's LED or not, but I just love again the way they've done that design. I suspect it is LED because the brake light of these row of LEDs in the middle here. But uh, again, it's just an example of where the bike is really nicely designed. So that's the backlight. Okay, so with the magic of YouTube, that's it. Uh, what the lights are like during the day, what they're like at night. So as if by magic, uh, night has occurred, and uh, it's a pretty horrible night actually. Riding at night and in the wet, not a great combo. But what I can say is pretty good is that headlight. It uh, chucks out an amazing beam. This is just the normal dip setting. You can never see very well on the GoPro. But uh, that one really does light up the road ahead. If I put her into full beam, there you go, that's full beam, and it uh, chucks it higher and further. Really excellent, that light, actually. One of the better lights I've done. So there's dip again, and there's full beam. You may not see much different on the GoPro, but uh, it does make quite a difference in reality. And, uh, yeah, really good visibility. Well, look at the switch gear here. There is no... Uh, Nothing's lit up on the switch gear, as you'd expect. It's not a complicated switch gear on the bike. And the uh, LCD dial here doesn't have a night mode. It's just as it was during the day. Not my favourite presentation, it has to be said. But the most important thing, of course, is the light, and uh, that works absolutely fine. It's odd that there's no um, flasher for it. But again, how many times do you flash people on your bike? Not that often. You could probably live without it. But nonetheless, a bit of a strange omission. I don't think I've ridden any other bikes that don't have that don't have a flasher. Whoops, hit the horn instead of the indicator cancel. But yeah, visibility at night, really good. Lights work well, I like it. Okay, another little practical test that I like to do on these uh, more in-depth reviews, just to uh, understand what the bike would be like to live with, is uh, just a little check in a car park to see what it's like lugging it around to simulate. Uh, you know, moving it around on your driveway or whatever. So let me just uh, pop into the car park here. See if I can find myself. No, not there. The car park is, in fact, the next one. <laughs> find myself a uh, empty parking space and just see what the turning circle is like. Crikey, that might be easier said than done. Oh, there you go. There's one that says MC. Not ideal, but it'll have to do on this occasion and there is an MC okay let's just uh, turn the bike off then all right so the first thing about the bike is uh, it's very very light so actually lifting her off the stand is no issue at all if you're a bit of a weakling or a small chap or maybe a, a female then uh, absolutely easy to get off the stand no problem there now if I wheel her out and put her on full lock just wheel her right out here put it on full lock here we go I have to say the turning circle on this is pretty good I mean, it wouldn't go round in one parking space, but here we go, look, around we go. So I started in the middle of the one with the motorcycle in. Let me show you where that was. Make sure I don't get killed. So I started there, 
and uh, it's gone 180 degrees in one parking space. So uh, about the width of a normal road, I'd say. So lugging it around at home or in a car park, absolutely no issue due to its nice lightweight and its cracking turning circle. So at the start of the video, I promise to tell you not only the good things about the bike, but the stuff I've learned over the period I've had the bike, the negatives as well. So let's go through those. I've lift, lifted them down here so I don't forget anything. Uh, so these, in no particular order, just things that have occurred to me as I've been riding the bike. First off, uh, the dash. Uh, it does have a fuel gauge, which is a good thing, but overall, I have to say, this instrument cluster, I don't like it. I think uh, Husqvarna have put it in here to be sort of in keeping with the uh, sort of design motif of the bike, um, but I don't, I don't quite like it. It would, to me, be better if it was a TFT screen. Uh, we know that... Uh, Husqvarna have access to these things. There could be a neat little TFT in there uh, that I think would just look better. It's a personal thing. In the main, I'm not a massive fan of TFT screens, but compared to this LCD plastic monstrosity that they put on the VIP pillar, I'd rather have one of those. So that's that. But good point is, it does have a fuel gauge, so it's not all bad as far as that's concerned. Uh, next thing, passenger seat. Here we go. Absolutely useless. Uh, who would want to sit on there? I certainly wouldn't. It's really quite hard. Uh, it's really a styling exercise. It looks, uh, it looks smart, for sure, and it's obviously been designed so it doesn't look much like a passenger seat, but I'm not sure sure if you've got a pillion it'd be too um, friendly and kind to put them on there so that's another thing that I think is a negative but I don't think too many of these are going to be used for riding with pillions to be honest. Um, the engine, the big single uh, piston on here, it is vibey below about three and a half thousand rpm as you would expect. The Husqvarna wizards have done all sorts of things with clever counterbalancing shafts and stuff to try and smoothen it out and for sure if you stir the gearbox you get it in the right rev range it smoothens out quite nicely but if you get it wrong it is riding like riding a pneumatic drill so uh, yeah you, you have to make sure that you keep it in the right rev band so you can be prepared to keep changing gear on this bike to keep it in that sweet spot. Uh, mirrors they just I mean they work fine but there's a little bit of vibration through them again if you get the revs wrong but they just look like Mickey Mouse's ears don't they I don't like those so they'd have to go and get some bar ends on I think you can get some bar end official accessories for this but uh, if not they're certainly available uh, aftermarket so the mirrors would have to go for me uh, and then uh, the other one rear mudguard well there isn't one it's uh, completely ineffective around the back end you've got that um, sort of almost GS like rear mudguard catcher thing but actually, the mud goes all up your back. It's an absolute nightmare. It makes a right mess of your jacket. So, yeah, that's another negative. It could really do with a proper mud guard of some sort to stop uh, all the crud being thrown over you. Uh, next, uh, the seat is pretty hard. Uh, on a long journey, that starts to get uncomfortable. You're all right for an hour, hour and a half, but once you're sort of into the three or four hours, um, it gets pretty, pretty tough on the old backside. The good news is it's quite long and you can move around on it. So if you are a taller rider, even though it's physically quite a small bike, you can find yourself a comfortable spot and move around. So that's a good thing on it. And then last but not least, the cost. Uh, it's quite an expensive bike when you consider it's up against things like uh, Street Triple, um, RS, um, the new Ducati Monsters, the new Speed Twin, that sort of thing. There are other bikes out there that are potentially, uh, maybe, you could argue, more desirable for less cash. So uh, that's the last of the negative points. All right, let's move on to the positive stuff. So the positives, there are plenty of those you'll be glad to hear. First thing is, and, and something that strikes you as soon as you ride the bike, just absolutely brilliant, brilliant handling. The thing, it's one of those bikes where you kind of think where you want to go and off it goes. It is so lightweight, flickable, agile, all those adjectives. It is a really lovely bike to ride. In fact, in terms of its lightness, it's possibly the, one of the lightest bikes I've ever ridden. It even feels lighter than my Honda CRF, which is the bike that I regard as light, even though it's not particularly. But yeah, this is, uh, this is amazing in terms of, of its handling. You will not be disappointed with that. Another thing, uh, again, may seem a small point, but it's a practical point. The turning circle on this is brilliant. These handlebars turn a good way lock to lock, and you can get the thing around in a normal road width, no problem at all. So that was a great thing. Uh, the engine, although I talked about it being viable in my negatives list, it does have amazing go and amazing shove. It is a grin-inducing engine. When you wind it on, just because it's a single cylinder doesn't mean to say it's going to be uh, an engine that doesn't go. It's got bags of torque and it absolutely flies. So uh, yeah, even on motorways at motorway speeds, you can overtake traffic absolutely fine. Great, great engine. Loads of shove. Really like that. The other thing is, um, amazing brakes. Given it's only got uh, a single disc on the front, he says, looking, checking, yes, it has. Uh, they, uh, but it is a Brembo four-pot calibre. They are very, very strong indeed. I thought the brakes might be a letdown on this, but the brakes work really, really well. And, of course, it's got that useful ABS and traction control, which is very handy. Um, next thing, quick shifter. My goodness me, that is one of the best quick shifters that I've used, which, give, again, given it's a single cylinder machine, I thought it might be a bit of a, a, bit of a clunky old quick shifter, but that works lovely both up and down. That's a great thing. Um, 
Another thing I, I guess about the bike is its quirky design. I mean, you either like it or you don't. Uh, I didn't think I l would like it from the pictures, but now I've got to know the bike and I've seen the quality of the build. Uh, the fit and finish on this thing is phenomenal. Uh, I really, really like it. It is a quirky look, and you may or may not like it, but uh, just, you know, the quality of things, just like the framework, the welds, the... The lights on it front and back look really nice. They've thought about every aspect. The design of it is lovely. And then the other thing to, to uh, finally on the positive list is the quite rare. You won't see many of these around. I'm not sure I've ever seen one of these on the road. I don't know why they're not more popular. Uh, maybe down to cost. Uh, but yeah, a, a lovely bike to ride. Beautifully designed. Really agile. Handles well. And uh, yeah, I really like it. So there we have it, that's my in-depth review of the Husqvarna 701 Vitpilen, a bike that really, really has surprised me. Uh, when I first picked the bike up, I didn't expect to like it as, anywhere near as much as I, as I did. I thought the design was a bit too quirky for me, but when you see it in the flesh, as I say, it looks lovely. The fit and finish on it is particularly nice. But uh, what really surprised me was the handling and the way the thing rides. Forget how it looks, it absolutely goes beautifully well. Uh, even though it's got that big old thumper cylinder engine, with the caveat that you've got to stir the gearbox a bit to keep it in the right rev range, it is a beautiful thing to ride. Uh, it's a shame I haven't had it in summer for chucking around the lanes. It's been absolutely brilliant. Anyway, there we go then. That's the Husqvarna Vit Pillen 701. Hope you've enjoyed that. If this is the first time you've seen one of my videos, thank you very much for sticking around until the end. It'd be great to have you subscribe uh, if you haven't done so already. I don't just do bike reviews here on the Missenden Flyer, but I also do uh, trips and tours. I do maintenance stuff. Uh, I do new bike reviews. I do basically anything and everything to do with motorcycles. I'll try and cover it here on the Missenden Flyer. It would be great to have you along. All right, that's it for this time. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Until then, this has been the Missenden Flyer. Cheerio.